This sermon is titled, The Church's Finest Hour. Be enriched as you listen. I want to just bring a simple word of uh, encouragement this morning uh, and just remind us that we are in the church's finest hour. We are living in the church's finest hour. Amen? And some say, Pastor, the book of Acts, you know, when the church was born, that was really great. But do you think God finishes poorly than what he started? Does he go downhill? No. God always finishes better than he began. Amen? The glory of the latter house is always greater than the former. Amen? And so we are going from glory to glory. And so where we are today is the finest moment where the church has ever been. And it's only going to get better. Amen? And so I just want to speak towards that for a few moments before we close today. I want us to point us to two passages of Scripture, if you will, please. Ephesians chapter 4. You've already, you are probably already there in Ephesians 4. Uh, Rohan brought us there. Ephesians chapter 4. We'll read verses 11 to 13. And then we'll also read a few verses from chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. The Apostle Paul wrote this here in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. He said, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Then we will also look at chapter 5 and verses 25 to 27. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 25 to 27. It reads, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. If we examine these passages, we will see in these two passages, what God is doing in the church today. What is God doing in the church today? We will see in these passages. I'll just come back to that in a few moments. But just to quickly take us through a journey through time. The first 400 years, the church was born on the day of Pentecost, somewhere around AD 30. And from that time, the first 400 years were powerful years. We read the first 40 years in the book of Acts, uh, the 28 chapters. Uh, the, the New Testament covers, you know, approximately till about 1890, so about 60 years. The book of Revelation written around 1890, thereabouts. So we see that the church was very powerful. And the and, and in those first 400 years, the church grew and uh, extended and, and uh, reached out to the then known world. By the time you come into the uh, 300s, 8300, uh, we, we, we had, you know, of course, there were the early church fathers. And then we had uh, the monks, the, the commonly known as the desert fathers, who went out to do seeking God and so on. You read about that in the first 300 years of the church. But... What we see thereafter is that once the Roman Emperor Constantine embraced the Christian faith and he began to get actively involved, while it was good on one side because the state now favored the Christian faith, it also was a big problem or uh, it just caused the church to go into uh, this, what we commonly refer to as the Dark Ages. The church became institutionalized. A lot of things were driven from, you know, from uh, civil side into the religious side. A lot of things were institutionalized. And the church began to pursue more of things that were of ritual in nature. 
uh, a lot of corrupt things came into the church. And for 1,000 years, the church became a feeble entity, no life in the church. And the common man didn't have access to the scriptures in darkness, uh, just following things that were spoken to them or inst instructed to them. So the church went through this period known as the Dark Ages for a thousand years. And thereafter, we see, this was around, around 1500s, we see God taking the church through a process of reformation, restoration, and revival. 1500, 1517, the year that's well known when, when Martin Luther, now there was a man, there was a monk, Erasmus, prior to Martin Luther, uh, who actually set things up for Martin Luther. Martin Luther, of course, is well known, but there are many historians will say that Erasmus loaded the cannon that Martin Luther fired, right? So we don't hear too much about him, but he was just preceding Martin Luther. But anyway, 1517 is the year uh, the Protestant Reformation began. And uh, so in the 1500s was the revelation of salvation by faith. In the 1600s, there was the, uh, the, the understanding of uh, the importance of water baptism. The 1700s, often referred to as the Puritan movement with John and Charles Wesley. And uh, uh, 1700s and the 1800s were the years of revival. So you look at the history of the church and there was revival happening all over the globe. Amazing stories of, of the move of the Holy Spirit. 1700s and 1800s, revivals happening all over the world. Towards the end of the 1800s, we see the restoration of the healing movement. Men like John Alexander Dovey and... Uh, Maria Woodward Etter and uh, uh, several others, and we have also uh, uh, Smith Wigglesworth and others uh, who brought, who br restored the healing movement in the church towards the end of the 1800s. You were all there back then, don't you? Remember? <laughs> oh, just joking. <laughs> right. So, but that was amazing what God was doing in the church. He was restoring the church, restoring truth, restoring the work of the Spirit. At the beginning of the 1900s, we have the, the birth of the Pentecostal movement. Uh, of course, the Azusa Street is well known for the, uh, or is often referred to as the birth of the Pentecostal movement. But there were things happening prior to that, both here in India, in Wales, and even in Northeast India, where there were mighty outpourings of the Holy Spirit, and, uh, and, and there were great revivals. But the Pentecostal movement is often referred, to back, referred back to the uh, Azusa Street in 1906. So that burnt the Pentecostal movement. There was a mighty move of the Holy Spirit all across. And when we look back at the previous century, we see the whole process accelerating. So in the last 500 years, God, you know, a church that was in darkness for a period of 1,000 years, within 500 years, God has brought the church out from a place of being a weak and feeble entity to being a powerful force on the earth. Amen. Today, almost in every part of the globe, you have spirit-filled churches. Men and women are reading their Bibles. Many of them read the Bibles in their own language. They are taught the scriptures. They know the truth. And, 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 and the, the fivefold ministry, starting from the 1970s, uh, we've seen the restoration of the fivefold ministries, the um, office of the apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, restored to the body of Christ. The church is being built up, and God is doing an amazing work in the church. Amen. And we are in the finest hour of the church. Amen. Now, what is God doing in the church? What do we see in these scriptures? So if you look into these scriptures, we see that our four main things, God is working in the church. Number one, and you look at Ephesians chapter 4, he's Place the apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist for the equipping of the saints. The saints are to be equipped to do the work of the ministry. You are a saint. What does God want you to do? Not just attend church. God has ordained that you be equipped to do the work of the ministry. So put your right hand up and say this with me. I'm a minister of God. I'm called, anointed, and appointed. Each believer is a minister of God. Amen? So the fivefold ministry is given to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. God wants to work through you. He wants to do something through you. And he says, 
for the edifying of the body of Christ. Ephesians 4.11. He has given these fivefold ministers, ministers for the equipping of the saints and for the building up of the body of Christ. So the church is being built up. And what is God accomplishing in the church? Number one. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. So where are we going? We're coming to the unity of the faith. Number two. And to the knowledge of the Son of God. So what's he doing? He's bringing us through that word knowledge in the Greek is very interesting. It means a perfect knowledge, complete, accurate knowledge. He's bringing us to a place where we will know Jesus for who he really is. Are you with me? This is what God is doing in the church. Number three. Till we all come to a mature man, a perfect man, to the full measure of the stature of Christ. So what's he doing? Number three. He's bringing us all to a place of maturity, which is Christ-likeness. And number four. This is in chapter 5, Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. The fifth thing, that he's, the fourth thing that God is doing is bringing the church to be a, into a place where it is without spot or wrinkle, a glorious church that is holy and set apart for him. So number four, he's bringing us to be a glorious church. So what is God doing in the church today? Four things. He's bringing us to the unity of the faith, to a Accurate knowledge of the Son of God to know Jesus fully accurately. Number three, maturing all of us to become like Jesus. And number four, the church is going to be a glorious church. Now I know some of us are thinking that can never happen. Not with all these denominations and pastors fighting with each other. That will never happen. But listen, just look at history. Just 500, just 500 years ago, the church was in a place referred to as a very dark period. The average common person didn't know what was in the Bible. Just, five, just 500 years ago. And in 500 years, look what the Lord has done. In just 500 years. Look what the Lord has done. Tell your neighbor, look what the Lord has done. In just 500 years, the Bible is the most translated book. The Bible is the most talked about book. Jesus is the highest, greatest name proclaimed all over the world. In just 500 years, an entity that was weak and feeble and written off, has now become the dominant force on the earth. Look what the Lord has done. So don't tell me that the church can never be brought to a place of the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to be a mature man, to be Christ-like, and to be a glorious church, a church that is holy and set apart and manifesting the glory of God on the earth. Don't tell me that can never happen. Look back and see what the Lord has done. Amen? And he will do it. He will do it. No man on earth, no government of any nation, and no force of hell can stop God from doing what he decided to do a long time ago. The church will come to this place of being united in faith. The church will come to this place of Knowing Jesus for who he really is. The church will come to this place where we can all grow up to the full measure of the stature of Christ. The church will come to this place where we will be a glorious church radiating and manifesting the glory of God here on earth. And God will do it. Because Jesus is not coming back for a weak and feeble church. He's coming back for a glorious church. Amen. So get ready. Get ready for that. Now I want, to, I want you to see your part in this. Worship team, please come. See, that's an indication that the sermon is going to end.
But I want you to see your part in this. The beautiful thing is we get to be a part of what God is doing. Amen? So say this with me. I get to be a part of what God is doing. You know, what a joy to be living in the church's finest hour. And you and I get to be a part of God fulfilling these four things right here on earth. But everybody says it's impossible. God is working right through you and me to make this happen. But I want you to see your part in these four things happening in, in, in the life of of the church. And when I mean the church, I'm not just talking about our local church. I'm talking about the body of Christ, believers everywhere, all over the world. See, you and I get to be a part of what God is doing, of helping the church come to this place of the unity of the faith. And, and I want you to commit yourself. I want to do this, that the church I want to help the church be a part of this whole process of helping the church come be united in the faith. I want, therefore, I avoid things that would promote discord and disunity and division. And I embrace those things that will strengthen unity in the body of Christ. You and I do not represent a denomination. You and I do not represent a brand of Christianity. You and I do not represent an individual that God has raised up. You and I represent Jesus Christ. Amen? And that's it. And you and I work from that vantage point that whatever I do, I want to glorify Jesus and I want to foster the unity of the, of, of the church because he is bringing us all to the unity of the faith. Secondly, what is he doing? He's bringing us to that perfect, complete knowledge of the Son of God. So you pursue that. Lord Jesus, I want to know you for who you really are. I can see you in the Word. I can see you in the Old Testament. I can see you in the Old New Testament. I can see you in the Gospels. I can see you in every book of the Bible. And Jesus, I want to know the Jesus of the Bible. I don't want to know the Jesus of some seminary. I don't want to know the Jesus of some theologian. I want to know the Jesus of the Bible. I want to know the eternal Word of God, the Son of God, the God who became man, who triumphed over Satan, hell, and death on the cross, who resurrected and he rose up again and then he anointed us with his Holy Spirit. I want to know the Jesus of the Bible because he's bringing us all to the perfect, complete, accurate knowledge of the Son of God. Amen? It's not about whether you know the Hebrew and the Greek. It's about do you know the Son of God? Amen? And thirdly, He's bringing us all to become like Jesus. So your goal and my goal is, I want to be like Jesus. Please don't tell somebody, I want to be like Pastor Ashish. Please. I'm still a work in progress. I'm not perfect. But if there's anything in me that is like Jesus, then imitate that. But I'm sure you'll find things in me that's not like Jesus. Please don't imitate that. <laughs> My desire is to be like Jesus. And your desire is to be like Jesus. Because he's bringing us all to be this mature person, which is the full measure of the stature of Christ. Spiritual maturity means Christ-likeness. Amen? And you get to be a part of it. And you say, Lord, I have only one prayer. Make me like Jesus. I want to be more like Jesus. In life, in word, and deed, I want to be like Jesus. Amen? And lastly, He's bringing us to be this glorious church. This church that will emanate His glory, display His glory, that will be holy and blameless, and reveal His glory and virtue. This is the church's final arm. You and I get to be a part of it. That His glory is revealed through you, wherever you are, through your work, your education, your studying. You may be a doctor, an engineer, a lawyer, an accountant, maybe a scientist, whatever. Through whatever you're doing, the glory of God, let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon you. Let His glory be seen in your life, right where you are. 
in your school, in your college, in your classroom, in your boardroom, in your, when you're on a sales call, wherever you are, the glory of God is being revealed through you. You're part of that glorious church. Amen? Let's stand to our feet, please. This is the church's finest hour. And things are going to get better, stronger, and greater. Amen? In God, today is better than yesterday. We are going from glory to glory, from faith to faith, from strength to strength. The end is always better than the beginning. Amen? I just want to remind you what Haggai chapter 2 verse 9, Haggai said, he said, the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former. Amen. The glory of the latter will be greater than the former. If God did it back in the Old Testament, surely He'll do it in the New Testament. You know, we are a church that will be more powerful. When I say we, the church, I'm talking about the body of Christ, that we will be more powerful, more full of the glory of God than the early church. Because the glory of the latter is always greater than the former. So worship team, please help me. What is the church? The church is the blood-bought and blood-washed, redeemed saints of God who have been made kings and priests unto God. What is the church? The church is Christ's body on the earth. We are His hands and His feet. We go where He sends us and we do what He tells us. What is the church? The church is the salt of the earth. We release the God flavors into our world. We dispense His life and virtue and preserve His righteousness and truth. What is the church? The church is the light of the world. We release the God colors into the earth. We emanate His expressions of wisdom, power, glory, and beauty, dispelling darkness and advancing the kingdom of light. What is the church? The church is the house of God. We are the dwelling place of God on the earth. And God dwells in us. He moves amongst us and He is seen amongst us. What is the church? The church is the pillar of truth. We are Paul truth and are standard bearers for justice, for fairness, for righteousness, for peace and equity for all. What is the church? The church is the branch on the vine, on the true wine. He, we express the life of the wine so that his fruit can be seen in and through us. What is the church? The church is the family of God. As sons and daughters, the Father cares for us and we care for each other. As his family, we love, we welcome and embrace each others as they come into the family of God through personal faith in Jesus Christ. What is the church? The church is a nation of holy people, a peculiar people, a people set apart to Him to walk in kingdom culture and values and to declare the praises of the one who brought us out of darkness into His marvelous light. What is the church? The church is the emissary of Christ. We are ambassadors of Christ, reaching out to a hurting world, announcing the good news of the kingdom of God and inviting people to be reconciled to God. The church are the anointed ones, sowers sowing seed, soldiers in conflict, laborers in the vineyard, born servants of Christ, earthen vessels filled with heavenly treasure, messengers of good news, called, appointed, and anointed by the Spirit of God, doing His will and releasing the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. The church is the bride of Christ. We are set on Him. Our hearts and our affections are devoted to Him. And we set ourselves apart as a bride for a groom, waiting for that great union in the sky and to be seated at the marriage supper of the Lamb of God. What is the church? The church is the work Christ is building to whom He has given the keys of the kingdom. As those authorized in Jesus' name, we find on earth what heaven has bound and be released on earth what heaven has released. What is the church? The church is the unstoppable move of the Holy Spirit of God through nameless and faceless men and women, Jews and Gentiles, people from every race, tongue, 
tribe and nation. This is the church's finest hour. This is the church's brightest day. This is the church's greatest moment. This is the church's final fray. And all the powers of hell cannot stop the advancing church. This is Christ's church. Hallelujah. Jesus, we exalt you. We exalt you. Let's sing. Let's sing. Every stronghold shall be broken. You wear the winter's crown. You will come. You will come. Every hard thing must come down. Every stronghold shall be broken. You wear the winter's crown. You will come. You will come. We're going to close in a few moments. And, uh, after we close, our pastors will be here. I think all our pastors are here today. And we're going to be available to pray for you. Uh, so you're welcome to come for prayer and ministry. If you've come here this morning and you have a need in your life, maybe it's a physical need, a healing. Maybe it's your situation, life situation that you're going through. We believe that Jesus of the Bible is the Jesus of today. He saves. He forgives sins. He heals us. He delivers us. He works in our lives. And so we'll be available to pray for you. But you come in faith looking to Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I come to you. These are ordinary people who are going to pray for me. They're just, just people. But when we connect our faith, the God of heaven will do a powerful work. Like you heard that testimony earlier. It's God who does it. But we just believe. We just look to Him. Before we close, we always like to give an opportunity for anybody to receive Jesus Christ into their life. 
Maybe a friend invited you here this morning. Maybe you're watching online. And you feel prompted in your heart to believe in Jesus Christ. That prompting is no ordinary happening. It's the work of God in your heart. And if anybody in this auditorium or anybody watching online, you feel prompted in your heart, I need to believe in Jesus. Because Jesus died for you and me on the cross. He bore our sins so we could be forgiven. He rose up again so that if we believe in Him, the Bible says He makes us the children of God. Sons and daughters of God. Nobody can do this, but only Jesus can. And this morning, I'm going to, before we close, I'm going to lead us in a simple prayer. Is anybody in the auditorium, anybody watching online, and you feel in your heart, you want to believe in Jesus, not as one among many gods, but as the only true and living God. It's easy to take Jesus and add him to many others. That's not what the invitation is about. The invitation is leaving all others. Will you follow Jesus? Now that's a choice you make and nobody can dictate you from either making it or not making it. You have the right to make that choice. And so this morning, I want to lead you in a simple prayer. If you're willing to believe in Jesus Christ for who he really is, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's what Jesus said. And if you're willing to believe it and say, Jesus, I come to you. Bring me into the family of God. Forgive my sins. If you're willing to do that, just pray this prayer with me, please. If you've never done this before, to say this, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I need to have my sins forgiven. You died for me on the cross. Forgive my sins. Make me a child of God. And help me to follow you and you alone the rest of my life. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody in the auditorium, you pray this prayer for the very first time. We want to rejoice with you. The Bible says there is great rejoicing in heaven over one person who turns to God. Anybody here, you pray this prayer with me. We just like to see you. Please raise your hand if you don't mind. Anybody in this auditorium, you pray this prayer with me. Let's see your hand. God bless you. God bless you. One, two. Anyone else? Anybody else? Just raise your hand, please. Raise your hand, please. Our, our sisters, now three over there. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Please keep your hand raised. Our ushers will come to you, give you a bag. It's called the New Believers Bag. Along with that, there's a card that says Decision Card. If you could just write your name, please, and your contact number on that. Just hand it back to them. Somebody from the church office will call you. will tell you how to use the resources in that bag. Also, at the end of the service, if you go, if you have a few moments, if you could make your way to the Visitors Welcome Lounge, people there will tell you how to make use of these resources and how to grow in your faith. Congratulations and God bless you for making this decision. For those of you who are online, please go to apcw.org slash FTV. Enter your details there so that we can reach out to you as well. We're going to dismiss. We're going to close uh, with a benediction and dismiss. Our pastors will be here to pray with you personally and minister to you personally. Let's close. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit with each of us always in Jesus name Amen this is the church's finest hour God bless you God work through you powerfully praise God, God bless you, see you again thank you for joining us online we trust this service was a blessing to you visit apcwo.org for free resources like books and sermons and sermon notes and for information on ABC Bible College in Bangalore, visit abcbiblecollege.org. If you have any prayer requests, you can always send an email to prayer at apcwo.org and we'll be sure to pray for your needs. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store. Have a great week. God bless you.